Good morning, good afternoon, good evening class. My name is Mr. Arosena and today we are going to talk about piecewise continuity. Okay, yeah, so this is because it's, I guess, piecewise continuity was somewhat difficult to understand a little bit, at least the mathematical portion of it. The actual concept is, I think, fairly easy. Okay, so a couple of things to remember from previous days. Uh, for a limit to exist, the following must be true. Okay, where the limit as x goes to a from the left side is equal to the limit as x goes to a from the right side. So basically, it means that my function, so if I have a function here, here's point a, the left side and the right side are all going towards the exact same point. For the previous lesson, the function is continuous if the following is also true. So if the limit as x goes to a exists, then this limit is equal to the function evaluated at a. Okay. Again, for most functions, this is not a problem. But for piecewise functions, this can be. Okay. Now, in order for a piecewise function to be continuous, both of these things must be true. That the limit as x goes to a exists, which means that this has to be true, where the left side limit is the same as the right side limit. And then when you evaluate the function at a, it equals that limit. Okay, so this is true for piecewise functions as well. Just piecewise functions are, I guess, a little more difficult to deal with because they're one function composed of multiple functions. All right, let's go through some examples. So here's f of x. We want to know, is this continuous for all values of x? Okay. Now the function itself looks like this. Here is a piecewise function, where for part of the function it's equal to x squared, and for the rest of the function it's equal to the square root of x. Okay, so we need to first figure out, is this continuous, this part here, always continuous? Okay, any points of discontinuity. Okay. Now let's examine it. x squared is just a parabola. x squared is just a parabola. Parabolas, uh, we know from like way back that they're always continuous. There's no discontinuities. Okay. So none. None. Okay. Now, this function here is this always continuous. Are there any points of discontinuity, okay? There could be, because it's a square root. And there's one thing we know about square roots is that they cannot be negative, or you cannot take the square root of a negative number, sorry. But we're limiting ourselves to all values of x greater than 1. So all values of x greater than 1, always positive. So this part of the function, always continuous. Good. So the first part of the function always continues in its condition. The second part of the function always continues in its condition. Now the function as a whole, is it continuous? So we kind of check. What about at x equals 1? What about at x equals 1? Is that continuous? Well, that's what we're going to check. Okay, so, so I'm going to go back to my definition of continuity. The limit as x goes to a must exist and must be equal as f of a. And in order for that limit to exist, the limit going, th or the limit from the left side has to be the same as the limit from the right side. Okay, so in this case, our a is going to be 1. So what is the following? The limit as x goes to 1 from the left side of f of x, what is that equal to? And what is the limit as x goes to 1 from the right side of f of x? Okay. Well, the left side is easy, because the left side is really just this function here. This is the left side, so we'll call this left, because it's on because this function is what happens when x is less than or equal to 1, or basically when x is on the left side of 1. And this is the right side, because again, x is greater than 1, so it's on the right side of 1. So the limit of this function as x goes to 1 from the left is going to be, uh, let's evaluate x squared at x equals 1, so this will be 1. That's great. x squared is equal to 1 from the left side. From the right side, do the same thing. Let's put 1 in to the square root of x. So on the right side, this is equal to 1. 
Right, so both limits exist. Okay, so therefore, therefore the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is equal to 1. Now, next condition. What is f at 1? f at 1, well, when x is equal to 1, which function do we evaluate? We, can't, we don't evaluate this one because this function is only when x is greater than 1. This function is when x is less than or equal to 1. So we evaluate the following. f of 1 is 1 squared, which is just 1. Okay. f the limit as x goes to 1 is equal to 1. The function at 1 is equal to 1. Therefore, continuous at 1. Continuous at x equals 1. Combine that with the fact that the x squared is always continuous, has no points of discontinuity in this interval, and the square root of x is also continuous with no points of discontinuity on this interval, we can safely say that, yes, this function is continuous for all values of x. Okay. Again, we've shown that because we calculated the left limit, the right limit, we've shown them equal to 1, and then we calculated the function at 1, and they're both the same. So this function is continuous. Alright, let's try another one. Alright, in this example, I'm going to give you two functions, and we want to figure out what value of c will make the function continuous for all values of x. Okay, so here are the two functions. Now this, was, this example will actually illustrate, I guess, a much easier way of thinking about piecewise continuities. Basically, for this function, I want to show that the first part of the function, so this part, so this is the left side limit, limit as x goes to 1 from the left of f of x, and this equation here is the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of f of x. And the easiest way to think about piecewise continuity in terms of a problem like this is to basically make it so that both parts of the function are identical. Okay, so make the limits the same. Make the limit as x goes to 1 from the left equal to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right. Right, so make them the same. This is the easiest way to think about continuity. If they're, if they're the same, then they're both going towards the exact same number. Okay, so here we go. So we just say the following. Uh, whoops. That. We say that for the left side, it's just x squared plus c. So this will be 1 squared plus c. The right side will just be negative 1c plus 9. Okay. After some algebra, we'll get the following. 2c is equal to 8, and c is equal to 4. So this tells me that c is equal to 4 will make both my limits the same. So now I can write the function as this. The function is now x squared plus 4, when x is less than or equal to 1, and negative 4x plus 9, when x is greater than 1. Okay, and then as with the previous example, we want to check what happens when x is equal to 1. Okay, now rather than going through the whole limit definition, all I really need to do is say, okay, at x equals 1, if the left side limit or left side function is equal to the right side function, it's continuous at x equals 1. Okay, so we'll calculate the following. At x equals 1 for this one, is x squared plus 4 equal to negative 4x plus 9 at x equals 1? Right. And I think it's pretty obvious it is, because if x is equal to 1, we get 1 plus 4. And if x is equal to 1, we get negative 4 plus 9. 1 plus 4 is 5, negative 4 plus 9 is 5. So this is correct. This is correct. So the value of c that will make the function continuous for all values of x is going to be this. And again, think of it as when what value of c will make this function or this function equivalent to this function at this value of x. Okay? And let's illustrate this with a graph. 
C is equal to 1, obviously the functions are not continuous in the least, because this function stops here, this function stops here. So let's change it. At C equals 4, my two functions, this is when they finally connect. Okay. I noticed briefly there, it showed that the black function, it's undefined at x equals 1. And the reason for that is because we limit our our condition is that x is greater than 1, can't be equal to 1. When x is equal to 1, then we switch to this function. And this function shows that we have a value at x equals 1. Okay. So that's another way to think about piece. What values will make a function continuous is basically at what value of c will these two parts meet. Okay. That's another way to think about piecewise continuity. That should help you guys out when dealing with example questions like this. Now, one last theory for today is the intermediate value theorem. This the th this theory is I would kind of want to say trivial, but maybe not really. It's easy to understand though. So basically, it says the following: If f of x is continuous on an interval from uh, a less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b, or sometimes it's written like this. basically means x is continuous on this interval, then there exists some number c that is between a and b that makes f of c exist. Okay. So, if I know the function is continuous between a and b, then I know that if I pick any number between a and b, the function is going to exist. Okay, so f of c, c being any number between a and b, f of c is going to equal some number. Okay? The function is going to exist. Okay. Now this theory, it seems pretty obvious, but and, and it, to be honest it is, because a continuous function is like, again, like if I have a straight line, here's a, here's b, and I have a straight line like this, straight line is continuous, then I can pick any number between a and b and my function will exist. The same is true of, say, a trig function or a polynomial function or basically any continuous function. As long as it is continuous between a and b, there's a number between a and b that keeps the function alive, keeps the function existing. Okay. Why is this useful to us? Because there's some applications that are actually kind of useful. Like in this example. So, prove that this equation 3x to the fifth minus 7x squared plus 3 equals 0 has at least one root on this interval. x somewhere between negative 2 and 0. Okay. Now, this function is a polynomial function, so this is continuous. Okay, so that's but that's the first thing one ask. Whoops, not if is 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 f of x continuous on interval. Okay, well, and since because this is a polynomial function, we can say yes. Now, how can we prove it has one root on that interval? Well, any polynomial function, regardless of shape, if it has a root, it's going to cross the x-axis at least once. Okay, this, in this case it crosses twice, but all we need to show is that between the interval, it crosses the x-axis at least once. Okay. And the easiest way to show this is, does f of x go from positive to negative uh, on the interval? Or al alternatively, x could go from negative to positive. Okay. 
the easiest way to do that is the following. What is, let's calculate, f of negative 2. Okay. This will tell me where I'm starting out. And then what is f of 0? That'll tell me where I'm ending. And if I'm going from a positive number to a negative number on that interval, it means I cross the x-axis. So that'd be like going, this is positive to negative. Negative to positive would be like here. Negative to positive. So if it exhibits one of those behaviors, then we know there's at least one root. The question's not asking us whether what the value of the root is. We just need to know, is there a root? Is a root going to exist there? So, f of negative 2, let's calculate that. 3, negative 2 to the power of 5, minus 7, negative 2 to the power of 2, plus 3. This is going to be uh, 3 times negative 32 is negative 96, minus 7 times 4 is 28, plus 3. This is going to be a really large negative number. Well, maybe not really large, but it's going to be a negative number. The actual number doesn't matter. F of 0 is easy to calculate, because we get 0 minus 0 plus 3. This is 3, which is a positive number. So the function goes from negative to positive. So it probably looks something like this. My function goes from negative to positive. So it crosses at least once. So there's at least one root. This function has at least one root on that interval. What the value of the root is? Well, we don't really need to know because the question is not asking us that. And you can do other math to figure out what the root is. But as long as it crosses, then we know that that root exists, or there's a root that exists there. Okay. Now, one application of this is, one application of this theorem is basically any graphing program. Because the graphing program can't plot, or can't calculate every single number on this interval. But what a graphing program can do is calculate various parts. Like for example, a very primitive graphing program might only be able to calculate this point and this point. But then it knows that it knows the function is continuous between the two points, so it kind of fills in the blanks as it goes. Okay. So your graphing calculator or computer would plot one point, plot the next closest point, and because it can't plot infinitely many points between them, it just guesses based on the intermediate value theorem. Okay. More powerful computers will obviously get more points and therefore give you a much smoother graph, but early computers didn't have that luxury, so we kind of had very choppy graphs to work with. But the intermediate value theorem helped the computer plot that graph. Because again, if it knows it's continuous, we can just make things up basically in between. Alright, here's your assignment for this uh, lesson. Uh, good luck with it, and if you have any questions, come see me in class.